Last week, global elites sauntered in with their private keys and flocked to Davos, Switzerland, and to blame the rest of us for climate change. Then their media lackeys attacked anyone who dared to call them out. With a tone of disgust, the Associated Press announced, as the elites arrive in Davos, conspiracy theories thrive online. CBS reported that, quote, as elites gather in Davos, conspiracy theories gain traction online. Then there was CNN that warned Davos conspiracy theories used to live in fringe corners of the Internet. Now they've gone mainstream. Wow. I mean, one would say it was almost like they were getting marching orders in a memo. The words of the German philosopher uh, ring true here. The power of an ideology is not only measured by the answers it could provide, but by the questions that it is able to suppress, end quote. Today's guest takes that as a challenge. This is an amazing, amazing man from Scotland. He has undergone, uh, undergone quite a metamorphosis over the last couple of years. Uh, he realizes that the people promising solutions are, are really the same people responsible for the problems. As Einstein said, the people who created the problems cannot fix the problem. Uh, he called the lockdowns the biggest mistake in world history. And this man happens to know history. He's a history enthusiast. He once described Klaus Schwab as a ludicrous parody of a movie villain. I mean, I think this guy is like a brother because I've, <laughs> I've said Klaus Schwab is just a white kitty cat away from a Bond villain. Same thing. Before becoming a, a political lightning rod, he was an archaeologist. He was a historian, an author, and a TV presenter. Um, he did all kinds of documentary uh, documentaries, um, I, I think, over in England. I think it's for the BBC, because don't they do all of it over there? He did programs about Cleopatra and Vikings and battlefields and Scottish history. What changed is when he spoke up against COVID and lockdowns and vaccines. It's cost him a lot, even friends. But... He's a Scot. He's outspoken about the erosion of rights. As he said in a recent monologue, merely to live is not enough. Not nearly. What matters is to live in freedom. He even told one of our producers that he believes he and I are brothers from another mother. You'll have to decide for yourself. Please welcome Neil Oliver. Last year, because of you... This uh, program, this network, saved over 50,000 babies' lives. Uh, it, it is amazing. And you really are the one who made this possible. This year, we're shooting for 70,000 babies' lives, saving lives. We like to call them the Blaze Babies. Maybe we'll build a village. <sighs> Will you join us? All we have to do is just pray for these people, stand with these people. And if you got some money... Help them out with money. Uh, it's a preborn ministry. Now, these preborn centers have rescued over 200,000 babies from abortion. They do it every single day. Every day, they save 150 babies' lives. And what they, how they do it is they use um, ultrasounds. So if you got a lot of money, join, join me and Tanya. We bought a couple of actual ultrasound machines uh, for uh, these pro-life uh, centers, preborn centers. Um, if you want to do uh, like a hundred and forty dollar do donation, you can you can do that, and that'll save I think four or five babies possibility with the ultrasound, um, or one ultrasound is twenty eight bucks. That's about the cost of a dinner. If you're going to McDonald's, you're going to McDonald's. Look, any way you can help, this is really important. Just uh, donate uh, by dialing pound two five zero and say the keyword baby. 100% of your donation is going to save babies. One ultrasound can change and save a life. Pound 250, keyword baby, or donate securely at preborn.com slash Glenn. Neil, how are you? 
Hello, Glenn Beck. I am fine. Thank you for asking. How are you? I'm I'm very good. I don't know if you sent the memo or I sent the memo, but we seem to be dressed almost. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I thought yeah. I thought we're kind of like brothers from different mothers in some ways. Mothers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Well, we're in tune, certainly. Yeah. Uh, I I will tell you that I am uh, I'm fascinated by you. I love people. Who, and it's very rare. I love people who are strong in their opinion and they know what their opinion is. And then new information comes along and they're like, well, I have to reevaluate. That does not happen in today's society, but it's happening more and more. And, um, you know, in America, you're, you're, you're maybe, maybe not as well known as you are over um, uh, in the UK, but. You are an archaeologist. You are um, a very logical man. And you are now, you've gone from, you know, stability and the man to, I think he might be crazy. What happened? Yes. It's a good question uh, that will take a bit of unpacking and answering. Sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, I am. I went to university in the 80s. Uh, I've got a degree in archaeology. I uh, worked in that field for a while. Then I retrained as a journalist working in newspapers, local newspapers, local weekly newspapers for a few years. Long story short, I stumbled into television in the, in the early 2000s. And I made, from that time onwards, for about 15 years, quite soft documentaries about archaeology, about history. Uh, celebrating landscape, uh, meeting interesting people along the way. Nice, soft, celebratory television. Uh, and then I, I did go through a, a, an evolution, I suppose, around the start of, or, or even before COVID's advent mm -hmm. and the, the lockdowns and all the rest of the, of the madness. Uh, I think I've, I, I put my head above the parapet a few times. Back in 2014, uh, there was a referendum held in Scotland to decide whether or not Scotland would remain part of the union right. of the United Kingdom right. or strike out as an independent country. I put my head above the parapet in favour of maintaining the union. I like Britain and said so, which made me a lightning rod for all kinds of uh, criticism from the other side those who, who fervently wanted Scottish independence. Now, hold on just a second. Uh, but it was me as a target. Hang on, it wasn't really Scottish independence. The choice was England or stay with the EU, which is worse, I think, y right? W well, yes, you raise a good point, because amongst the arguments that I subsequently went on to make, and I wasn't alone in doing this, uh, it, it seemed to me that it, it, the analogy would be if you wanted to get divorced from your overbearing partner, uh, might it not make sense to just be on your own, <laughs> at least for a while, mm -hmm. where what was being proposed by the Scottish National Party was a quickie divorce and then scuttle down the aisle as fast as possible to marry Europe, mm -hmm. an even more overbearing partner. Because having having broken with, with, uh, with the rest of the UK, uh, Scotland would have been out of the European Union mm -hmm. in every way and would have had to reapply and would have been seeking to rejoin as an independent country, which would have been bedeviled by problems, not least the fact that countries like Spain, uh, with the with the with the Basque separatists mm -hmm. and uh, Catalonia and mm -hmm. and the rest, and were not likely to be receptive to a separatist secessionist country joining because it would set a precedent mm -hmm. that, that might have been uncomfortable. Anyway. Long story short, yes, I, I didn't. It didn't make sense to me that you would break one marriage only to get married again into even more uh, uh, repressive circumstances, even less independence and d more it didn't strike me as independence at all. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you just if you if you don't like being told what to do by a distant and overbearing partner, wh why on earth would you swap London for you know for for the Brussels. European Union? It yeah. didn't make any sense to me. Um, yes, so. So that was the first time I put my head up and I remained in trouble ever after <laughs> uh, because that, that, that debate never went away. You know, the referendum settled it. The, the union was maintained by a vote of 55% uh, to 45%. Uh, but, but that said, the call for another referendum has never gone away. Th then uh, I, I was still in the public eye, I suppose, but um, as, as nothing really compared to what happened 
subsequently. I, I put my head up again around the time of the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, which started with you guys and mm. then eventually went everywhere. Yeah. And here in here in Britain, it manifests itself in well statues being pulled down yeah. and calls for other statues to be torn down. There was also a wholesale uh, you know, attack on our heritage, culture, rewriting mm-hmm. history, portraying Britain, the British Empire, as only and always something bad. Mm-hmm. And I, I was quite outspoken in defence of Britain and, and against the tactics and really the politics of BLM. And and so that, that attracted... Con- I was controversial again at that yeah. point. Yeah. And then, and I was doing that on a radio show. A friend of mine uh, who had a radio, has a radio show, had me as a weekly guest and we would chew the fat for half an hour about the, the issues of the day. But it started with BLM and then it moved on to freedom of speech, uh, protection of heritage, the rewriting of history and all sorts of topics. Then along came COVID and lockdown, uh, which obviously changed everybody's lives. In the midst of that, I was approached by a new startup television channel in the UK called GB News, mm-hmm. Britain's news channel is its kind of subtitle. And I was invited to become one of its original lineup of presenters. And I, and I, I said yes, and I've been doing that ever since. That's been up and running for nearly two years now, or it'll be two years in uh, in the spring. Um, and I've been, again, uh, cast as controversial. GB News was cast as a far-right, uh, extremist, uh, home of swivel-eyed, tin-hat-wearing loons, yeah. even before a frame of its, brought, of its output had gone on television, mm-hmm. uh, none of which is true, I think, as anyone would, would, would admit if they bothered to watch any of the content. Anyway, that's a matter of opinion that people can agree or disagree upon. Uh Yes, you started out by saying that uh, I, I've I've become someone who's characterised as one of the people who have, let's say, extreme views. I don't buy that for a second. I think I stayed in place and the world slipped out from under my feet and 100%. Went, to, went to my place. 100%. And where I, and where, and, and where I always was. Yeah. I, I hold... I've, I was never political. I've never been a member of a political party. For the whole of my life, I have treated politics and politicians with, well, almost contempt, really. I'm very suspicious and cynical about the political class. Every time a general election came around, I would have to sort of hold my nose and find someone to vote for. But there was never anyone that I liked. I always just was in a position of having to pick the person that I disliked least. Right. So I'm not a, I'm not a card-carrying political uh, uh, supporter of the left, of the right, or of the centre. Uh, I always, I just mean, I suppose I was a centrist, but only because I didn't feel pulled to either extreme. Uh, I, I think I've always held quite rational, middle of the road, perhaps traditionally liberal with a small L views. I just believe in freedom, right? freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom to protest, freedom to get on with your life with right. minimum government, actually. Is well, what I believe in. And if that makes me a contrarian and an extremist, then so be it. Yeah, I, I, I have to tell you, we are having the argument that it's, you know, Republicans, Democrats, it's this party, that party, back and forth. I've really come to the conclusion that is only a distraction. It really is because it's happening all over. It's happening all over the world. People are standing up because they're not being listened to by their government they're being ruled over. They are not. It's not a government of the people, by the people, for the people in America. And it's not happening in any country. You've got farmers being told what they can and cannot farm. You're destroying the Dutch farmer, which is kind of important. Um, you, you're destroying the industry of oil and gas. I mean, how do you survive in England without oil or gas or coal? So people are standing up and we're we have to find a way to wake people up to it's not we're not fighting with each other. They're making us believe that our fight is between each other. It's actually the people versus the elites. Oh, yes, I agree. Glenn, I, I don't just match you shirt for shirt. I, I agree with everything that you said there in that brief summary of the problem. I have an adage that I cling to all of the time, which is it's never about what they say it's about. Yes. 
we're being thrown one we're, we're being you know when you sometimes people play with a cat by by with a torch and they shine a light yeah. on the floor and the, and they just move it around right. and the cat springs mm-hmm. from where the bright patch is to the next place where the bright patch is uh, hold on I just a second just attempted. for the american audience i want you to know even though i hate cats and i might play with a cat with a torch that's the English word for flashlight, but go ahead. A flashlight. <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course. You, yes, not a blowtorch. I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about playing with a right. naked flame and a living animal. No, a flashlight. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, and I think we're being distracted with one thing after another. Yes. COVID worked very well for that, that elite group to get, to get everybody looking over there. Look over there, COVID. And then it has never stopped. Then it's, you know, it's a climate crisis. Look at the climate. We're burning the planet to a crisp. It will shortly be a ball of charcoal falling through infinity, leaving a trail of smoke behind us. If you listen to the to the, the, the prophets of doom, uh, the war in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine is not about saving democracy. I'm, I'm not really going to say what I think the war in Ukraine is about, but it's not about saving democracy. So that's that's a that's well, another useful distraction to get may, people terrified. May may I suggest? Uh, I was just on the air today, and I uh, said something that uh, it puts me into a category that I'm uncomfortable being in because I'm a guy like you. I trusted institutions. I trusted my government. I believed in it enough, you know, same with politicians, but enough to go, you know, we make mistakes, but we generally try to do the right thing. I believe our government, the United States government and most Western governments are so far off the rails. I truly believe that this is all about the Great Reset. Uh, and we are we watch our president and it is like we're itching for war. Why would you send not defensive weapons, but offensive weapons that, you know, are going to be used in the Crimea, which Putin will never do it. And even today, day number one, they're in Russia saying they're declaring war on us. Joe Biden a year ago said If we send tanks and airplanes that, listen, folks, no joke, it'll be World War Three. I think they are trying to collapse uh, our economies. They're trying to collapse the social order so they can reset it all closer, as your Fabian socialist said, closer to their heart's desire. Yes, I think so. I mean, am I I not right in saying that uh, when Joe Biden pulled America out of Afghanistan, he said it was in part to do with bringing to an end uh, America being involved in forever wars? Yes. I and And I don't think it was. I think that was partly to give the Air Force base Bagram. You were part of that. Your your country was part of that. We didn't consult anyone. We just gave it. It's insane. Yes. So we pulled out, or, or America pulled out of a forever war, and now it would appear is is straight into another forever war. American politics is not my area, of course it isn't. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't presume so, but I, I, I would just say that I, I, my suspicion is that a lot of what's happening in in Ukraine has to do with 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 the U.S. seeking to reestablish itself as the predominant a predominant world power. Hence, what a great dog! Are you looking at this one? Yeah, what a great <laughs> dog! I, mean, you, I don't think you can live in, in Scotland here. without that kind of dog, can you? This is this is this is one of my Irish wolfhounds. No, uh, Glenn, give me a sec. I'm just going to put her out of this room. Give me one second. Yeah, I'll be okay. straight back. Hang on. <laughs> oh, while he goes to put the dog out. Something that hasn't happened before, it's a good time to take a break. Uh, The American Society of Healthcare Pharmacists, the group that tracks the production of medications all around the world, has declared a worldwide shortage of antibiotics, specifically amoxicillin. This is a critical drug used to combat all kinds of infections. And in some cases, um, you can't get it right now. That's pretty terrifying. I mean, it is, it's amoxicillin, man. I think I... I think I would take that when I had an infection as a kid. It's been around forever. The Jace case is here to save the day. Jace case from Jace Medical. It is a great way to keep yourself prepared for the very worst, but it's also a way just to stay prepared. If you're going on vacation someplace, you get uh, a pack of five different courses of antibiotics that you can use to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, things like UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, and a lot more. 
It is a great way to be ready for shortages, and it's perfect for the small things in your traveling. This has really changed people's lives. This is something that I highly recommend. The Jace case. Here's where I want you to go. JaceMedical.com. Jace, J-A-S-E, medical.com. Use the offer code BEC10 at checkout and save. Can we talk a little bit about, and I'm leading someplace with this. I work with a guy who uh, is Scottish. And, uh, you know, when I first met him, everything, Scotland, you know, built the moon. You know, <laughs> everything was Scottish. And I started doing my homework be- mainly because I wanted to put, we, we rip on each other hard. Uh, and, uh, and so I read a book by one of my favorite historians um, uh, called, I think it's How S- the Scottish Saved the Western World or something like that. And I was astounded by how much of our founding, the stock and the strength, came from the Scottish. Um, I want you to talk about that for just a bit. What did Scotland contribute to the world of freedom? And I I have some follow-ups. I'm going someplace. It's a big, interesting question. Um, Scotland was, uh, was well, is a small country, a small population by comparison. It's small in every way uh, in terms of geography and population and indeed wealth when compared to England. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it always, it always a testy relationship mm-hmm. with between the two. Mm-hmm. You know, they were always like, I don't know, big brother, little brother or, or whatever analogy you, you might want to make. Then finally, the, the crowns came together in 1603. Elizabeth I died. She was succeeded by uh, James VI and I. He was a Scot, Scottish king. He became the King of England and Scotland. Then in 1707, the parliaments, the, both the English and the Scottish parliament were dissolved. And, a, and a, a separate parliament of a united parliament was created in 1707. That was very controversial at the time. When the when the when the Scottish Parliament was dissolved and the ink was drying on the paper that had dissolved that Parliament, the bells in the in the in St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh played Why Am I So Sad on This My Wedding Day? Mm-hmm. Which is an old Scottish tune, which kind of summed up the mood of the of the people. There was a lot of why why on earth are we getting married to our old enemy? Mm-hmm. Was was the theme in a way. However, that said, it became the best thing that had ever happened to uh, either Scotland or England. S- Scotland and, and England together became much greater than the sum of the parts. And it, it opened the world to Scotland at that point. It, it, England effectively had an empire of a sort. It certainly had more contacts overseas than Scotland had had independently. And by wedding with England, it, all of those doors were opened. You know, what's mine is yours. What's yours is mine, mm-hmm. you, you know, to continue that marriage analogy. And Scotland took that opportunity by the scruff of the neck. And the Scots became really preeminent, disproportionately represented in what became the British Empire. Everywhere the British Empire went, be it to India or into Africa or or anywhere else, Scots, often a disproportionately large number of Scots, were at the forefront of it wherever it went Great organisers, uh, great uh, administrators, great bureaucrats, great engineers, great fighting men. So Scots, and then then that bridgehead having been established by the by the soldiers and the and the engineers and the administrators, the rest of the population really saw the opportunity as well. And so, if in short order. Scots were everywhere on the planet. They were there, and in many, in most instances, they were there in, in helping to improve places, often by dint just of being there and being hardworking and industrious. And so the, the Scots began to reap the rewards of, of the British Empire, <coughs> every bit as enthusiastically as any English person did. And We now find ourselves in a situation where I think it's reasonable to estimate that there's perhaps, well, there are about 5 million Scots in Scotland, but there's estimated to be 50 million people of Scottish descent scattered around the globe. 
right? You know, that's that's the extent to, to, to which we made that impact. And so really, I, I think in answer to your question, I think uh, the, the opportunity of that 18th century union opened the world to Scotland and the Scots by nature, by inclination, were ready, were ready for the off. There's an interesting bit of, of background as well. Before the union, before any of that happened, the, the Reformation that happened all across Europe, mm -hmm. that, that where people broke away from the traditional mm -hmm. Catholic Church and be, and became Protestant in all in all various different sects and and mm -hmm. uh, and forms of the Protestant faith, in Scotland, very much the leader of the Reformation in Scotland, the man that came to the fore was John Knox. You'll know obviously, and he insisted amongst other things that every parish really in Scotland should have a school. Up until that point, education had been harder to come by. It was really the preserve of, you know, the great and the mm -hmm. good. Rich men's sons were educated and, and, and not so much for the rest. John Knox and the Reformation meant that, well, he wanted everyone, every man, woman and child to read the Bible in English for themselves. You know, get away from bishops and the hierarchy mm -hmm. of the church. Establish this personal relationship with God. And, and to do that, you needed to be able to read so that you could read your Bible and the 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 collateral benefit of all of that was that everyone learned to read and write and in short order in the in the century following the reformation scotland became the most literate population in europe a larger proportion of scots of all classes rich and poor male and female could read and write competently than anybody than any other population that you might want to point a finger at and that was that was that was incredibly important as well because when you then subsequently got the union when Scotland and England came together and the world opened up, you had all these educated people. Right. You had all you, and to, and the, I mean, and the, the thoughts fear. the thoughts from these educated people um, made their way to America and our founders used a lot of these new thoughts and really well Absolutely. argued thoughts to create our nation. So here's yeah, and and I, every time I look, I, I brought something. I have a incredible um, history museum, and one of the things we uh, collect are um, are any tales from the the Western culture. So this is mm -hmm. this is one of our new acquisitions. This is the sword of Braveheart uh, from uh, the Mel Gibson movie. When we think it of, is not, it is. It wow, is. yeah, it is. Oh. Um, uh, when you come over, I'll let you put it on. Uh, but, uh, oh, wow. Uh, but when we think of the Scots, we think of people, at least in America, people who fought to be free, fought to be free, fought against the kings, fought against all of this stuff, and knew who they were, proud in heritage. And now the Scots are, I mean, no offense, but it's like your sheep now. What happened? The, this, the Scottish National Party happened. Uh, when I was a kid, I'm 55, when I was growing up uh, and becoming aware of things political, let's say, you know, when I knew what was going on, the Scottish National Party was very small. It was a fringe movement, really, uh, often regarded as quite an eccentric bunch, uh, a, 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 a protest group in many regards, very small in membership. And then by very clever politicking uh, under a, a, a succession of, of competent politicians, it began to grow. And then and then famously under Alex Salmond, it reached a high watermark by achieving this long dreamt of referendum that would have that was to decide whether or not Scotland remained part of the union or left, as previously discussed. And then that didn't happen. Alex Salmond then stepped away and was replaced by Nicola Sturgeon, who is the first minister and has been ever since. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, the, the Scottish National Party and Nicola Sturgeon have run Scotland into the ground. Uh, they are incompetent would be the fairest way to describe what's been going on. Everything they touch turns to, well, yeah, everything they touch turns to something you wouldn't want to touch or smell. Right. And uh, the infrastructure, uh, the, the National Health Service in Scotland, uh, education. But it's it, not... This, uh, having a Scottish education... It, it's not just... Used to be... Have, go ahead, go ahead. Having a Scottish education used to be something you bragged about. You know, anywhere in the world, if you had been educated at school in Scotland 
and then at a Scottish university, that was a badge of that was a badge of honour, and you could sort of hold your head high anywhere. When people learned that you'd been educated in Scotland, that meant something. It really meant something. Now, education standards have fallen so far in Scotland that Nicola Sturgeon and her SNP government have taken Scotland off of the international league tables because it's too embarrassing now to have Scotland compared with other nations because we fall so wow. far down the league. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, so, so in every in every way, so that's that is what hap- That's what has happened to Scotland, and it's very important. I would say, Glenn, it's very important for your for your audience to hear that. The, the portrayal of Scotland that, that comes from the SNP and the Scottish government does not speak for the majority of Scots. They've never been a majority. They have a major, They have control of the Scottish government, but they're still a majority party, a, a minority party. They are still mm-hmm. a minority party in the Scottish Parliament. They're, they're given decision-making ability by an unholy alliance with the Greens, right, the Green Party. Right. However... But they don't speak. And I think people in England, certainly, and perhaps people in North America, they might get the idea that when they hear Nicola Sturgeon's voice, that's Scotland speaking. It's not. It's well, the what, Scottish what? nationalists speaking. And the majority of Scots are, are, are of the sort of Scots you're still talking about. The people who want good education for their children. They want to be you know, part of the wider world. You know, they're, they are welcoming to any and all, including the English. I mean, the old animosity with England is the stuff of right. ancient history. Right. There's, a bit of, there's a bit of rough and tumble around an international f- uh, soccer game or an international sure. rugby game. And, it, and it's quite fun. It, it, but it's a 90 minute. It's a 90 minute situation. It's mm-hmm. for the, du- the duration of the game. So it's important that, in, in my opinion, if, if you want to take my word for it, that this, the Scots are still what they always were. You just don't hear them so much. We are watching the collapse of our most trusted institutions. And I think you can you can hear it in this podcast. Um, everything is changing. Everything is collapsing. Everywhere you look, the wheels are falling off. That's why I would urge you to invest now in emergency food before it's too late. I'm talking about the, the farmers in, uh, in Holland. These are, these are some of the most important farms in, uh, on the continent of Europe because they provide, they're the second uh, most prosperous uh, or productive farmers in the world. And the government's just shutting them down. What are you going to do when there's no food? Hopefully this doesn't happen in America, but there's going to be a food shortage around the world. Please make sure your family is prepared. MyPatriotSupply.com. Get their three-month emergency food kit. It's a new lower price. You're going to want to see. I trust My Patriot Supply. I have their emergency food kits for my family. Get them for your family now. MyPatriotSupply.com. Explain to me. Um, something because this is what I was driving at. Um, your COVID lockdown was probably only second to uh, Australia or New Zealand. Um, it it and and it it instituted all of these tracking devices, and now you've just declared a new national emergency, as I understand it, with global warming. And now you're being restricted on how many miles you can drive, or at least they're tracking all of it. Can you explain what's happening and how, yes. how is Scotland putting up with this? Well, as previously mentioned, it's never about what they say it's about. COVID enabled uh, politicians to take for themselves an inordinate amount of power, the like of which they had never previously had. They've been drunk on that power ever since. And in the way of politicians, having shortened the leash around the people's necks, they are completely disinclined to give us any slack. So having been able to take away people's liberties in all manner of ways, they are disinclined to give them back to us Mm -hmm. as if they were ever theirs to give us in the first place. I mean, those rights are are born rights. You know, they they are rights instituted by the universe and God or 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 whoever it is that you take your that you take your transcendental orders from. But having got those powers, they want to hold on to them. COVID has run out of steam, and now the climate crisis, so called, which I don't buy into at all. I believe that the climate changes in the same way that I believe the climate has been changing for billions of years. Correct. For as long as there's been an atmosphere on planet Earth, there's Correct. been a climate. Yep. The climate changes. Subject to our relationship with the sun, we live in a solar system. That's the important mm. word 
we are driven by the sun and sometimes we go through depending on our relationship with the sun the angle of the tilt of the planet this the shape of our orbit from from steep oval to more of a circle dictates periods of warm and periods of cold and they alternate and even in the, within living memory within recorded memory there have been very hot periods followed by cold periods i grew up in a time when we were being told in the uk that look out there's a new ice age coming oh yeah me too and there were photo, there were there were, there were mock ups on the front pages of daily mm-hmm. newspapers showing icebergs floating down the thames and polar and bears in one of the and, and now it's and now it's time magazine did a story in 1972 i think talking about the ways to solve it and one seriously discussed solution was to put soot on the polar ice cap. I mean, I mean their, yeah, their, uh-huh. their suggestions now are just as ridiculous, except the well, well, governments are run with these private partner, you know, public private partnerships, the banks, the central banks who are just looking for power and money. And they know what they've built is collapsing, so they're just building framework that will catch them. We'll all fall into the in, into the bottom. They'll be fine, and and they're doing it without even they're doing it in spite of us, in spite of us saying, "Don't no, don't do that." Yes. So your your question to me was, you know, how how we are how we are responding to it. I, I I speak to people. People come up to me, and I'm quite. Rec- I live in a small town. I live in Stirling in Scotland. It's a small town, sixty thousand people or something, and I'm quite recognisable. And people, t- I talk to people all the time. I get I get letters from people all over the world. People people write. I don't have any of them to hand at the mm. moment, but I, I get letters every day, addressed. They, I, they don't even have my address. They come to. Uh, they're addressed to Neil Oliver, the guy off the telly. <laughs> or, or, there'll, or, there'll be a, or, there'll, or there'll be a picture of me, mm-hmm. sometimes drawn by hand, and an arrow saying this guy. And the, the postman delivers all these letters to me, and I, so I, I get I, I'm able to take quite a good straw poll of what's out there in the in the wider population. And people are not happy. They don't get to voice. Uh, they don't get to air their opinions in the way that I do. You know, I'm very. You and I are very fortunate in that we have platforms and we're able to get the word out about what we're saying. But there's there's a huge groundswell of of population out there who know, who have awoken at different times, in their own time, in the same yeah. way that I did. We're yeah. all operating on different internal clocks and different things trigger different people and make them aware. There's all these people out there, too many, I think. The, that, that lump of the population now that is awake, has tuned into what's going on and doesn't like it, is more and more numerous. And I think that the, the, the elite, the powers that be and whatever, I think they have a real problem. I think they have a tiger by the tail now. You know, you talk about these public-private partnerships. The, the World Economic Forum, uh, you know, operating out of Switzerland, Klaus Schwab being its boss, you know, he talks and has been talking since the 1970s about stakeholder capitalism. Correct. Which, when you boil it, when you boil it down, it, it basically means giving the boards of huge transnational corporations the decision-making power in lieu of national governments. It, uh, well, so instead of the government is actually kind of in charge. It's more fascistic. I mean, isn't this the definition of fascism? The public-private partnership. Yes, it's a it's a tyranny. Right. I I come up a couple of things. You mentioned uh, the the impact that Scots had had in North America, and obviously I would echo that. I'm very aware of of a of a man, a character, uh, Francis Hutchison, who in the latter part of the 18th century, so the 1700s, 1770s something, he held the chair. He was the professor of moral philosophy at Glasgow University, and he he taught, he preached almost that. Rather than being manna from heaven, f- falling randomly onto the onto the heads of the blessed, happiness happiness was something that ought to be worked for. And he, furthermore, he suggested that to make yourself happy, the best way to do that was to work with all of the strength of your body and spirit to improve the lot and the lives of others. Yes. And that the collateral benefit thereby would be your happiness. You would make yourself happy almost by accident. Correct. By making other people's lives better. Now, one of the people that he that picked up that lesson in his classrooms was John Witherspoon. Mm. John Witherspoon was eventually invited to be the second president of what became Princeton. 
university. Mm -hmm. he, he became the second president. He's also, of course, a signatory of the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. And there's good reason for speculating that the very idea of life... Uh, Love, uh, life, love, and the, and the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness might be an echo of Witherspoon. That happiness was to be earnestly pursued. It wasn't a gift. It, it, it didn't just happen to lucky people. It was the obligation, the responsibility of each one of us to pursue with all the fibre in our beings happiness. And by that pursuit, we would make the people around us, the communities, the families, we would make those people happier as well. So there, there was something fundamental and profound that came out of the, the Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment, that, that went around the world. And there's, there's, there, there's certainly good reason for thinking mm -hmm. it certainly had an influence on that, on that, um, on that gathering that, that was working out and talking about what the nature of the new, uh, the new country of the United States of America was going to be. And I also come back all the time to uh, Magna Carta, 1215. That was a, a grand charter that was sealed. The King John couldn't, didn't sign it. He sealed it with a with a seal into wax. He was, but he was he was made to acknowledge a document that can be summarised as saying, "Even the king is subject to the law. Right. Even the king is subject to the law. You don't just get to do what you want because you're powerful." And because your dad was the king as well, you don't. That's not how it works. You're subject to the law, and in Magna Carta enshrines something else which is fundamental, which is that even if you're told that government has power, it doesn't. The only peop the only entity that is sovereign, is the people. The people are sovereign, and all of the power rests with the people. And people need to be re-educated in the fundamental concept that we lend our our power to our elected representatives. And when their time in office comes to an end, they hand that power back right. to the people right. to then redistribute it again. And all of this nonsense that's going on at the moment, this public-private partnership, stakeholder capitalism, this is just a ruse by a narrow elite of people that want to centralise power. They want to take control of energy. They want to take control of the food. They want to take control of our currencies, uh, our finances. They want control of everything. They want centralised, top-down power. And we're being distracted left and right by COVID, a pandemic, another pandemic in two years' time, climate crisis, war in Ukraine, and in the background, all of these pieces on the chessboard are being moved without us noticing it to enable the kind of tyranny that you're describing. And people need to waken up to something quite simple, which is that they, we, the people, there's eight billion of us and there's a few thousand elite. We have the power and we are not to be told what to do. On the contrary, we tell them what to do. And the sooner the mass of the populations remember that inalienable right then the happier we'll all be. I just read uh, something that uh, was um, done on American radio in 1937. I think it's called The Fall of the City. And it's, it's profound. Uh, and it, it talks about how the city or the empire falls. Um, and it is the people that just give up their freedom they are so afraid of something else that when the conqueror comes, and in this case, the armor is completely empty, there's nothing there, um, that the people cheer and, and uh, say, thank God we got rid of freedom. It was corrupting us. Uh, all of these things. That's exactly what's <clears throat> happening right now. And I... I you know, I've struggled with this for a while, and I'm this one of the reasons I love talking to you is I love to see people who woke up and what woke them up. Because we don't make it if they build this whole system. It's going to be harder to get out once this whole, you know, China is the model kind of system. How do we wake people up? What, what has to be said to people? What do they need to see? To, to realize, for instance, the World Economic Forum, that's not a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy fact, and it's all out in the open. Yeah, well, conspiracy theories get a bad rap. Right. For a start. Right. I mean, let's agree on that point. I mean, conspire 
literally means to breathe together. You know, it's it's where your heads are close enough together that you can that you're sharing each other's breath while you're talking to one mm. another. That's conspiring, and you know that's what has been going on for a lot of people who have awoken that while they were locked down in their homes. Or I love how that prison parlance became, you know, the the, the common speak of the of the free people. Lockdown, mm. excuse me, but in lockdown people conspired because they were in their homes together and they started to talk and thank god for the internet you know people were able to conspire online and share ideas and reassure one another that they were not alone and they hadn't gone mad that there were that there were that thousands and then tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people who believe and think the same thing so, so conspiracy gets a bad rap thank goodness for conspiracy to be quite honest with you that's why some of us are where we are today by, by sharing breath um, how do we get out of it? I think people need to be reminded of that which they know to be true. You, you know, when you take it all the way back to, you know, what's known in, well, and certainly in, in, in historically in Britain as common law, but if you take it even further back to natural law, everyone knows right from wrong. You know, that's the, that's the premise of, of natural law. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows right and wrong. Whether they choose to choose the right or the wrong, is that's personal. But everyone knows the difference between. And people, because of that, are more than capable of, of governing themselves. Mm -hmm. That's you're talking about government of the people, by the people, and for the people. What's being instituted at the moment, certainly here, but all across the West, it is a is a is a framework within which, and it's been there for a long time, where governments legislate, they they make up law. That's what legislation is. They conjure up laws out of nowhere, and they then retain to themselves the power to enforce those laws and also to punish those who break the laws. That is the definition of tyranny. If your governing body makes the laws imposes the laws and punishes breaches of that law, that means they're holding all the levers of power. Common law, which is there in Magna Carta, but is much older than Magna Carta, it's a, th it's a thousands of years old principle, really enshrines within it the power of the jury. You know, we get trial by jury. Mm -hmm. Well, people have forgotten what that really means. In, in the original iteration Trial by jury was manifesting the democracy of the people. It was it was manifesting the power of the people because when a, when someone was brought for trial before a jury of their peers of people just like them, that jury of twelve people in England or fifteen people in Scotland was empowered, actually obliged, not just to decide the guilt or innocence of the accused, but to judge the justice of the law. And it meant that even if the evidence demonstrated that a person had broken the law, had broken the legislation, it didn't automatically mean that they had to be convicted. The jury had the power to say, yes, I've heard all of that. I know the law and I've heard the evidence. And we as a majority still think that person should be acquitted. And furthermore, mm. we're setting aside that law as, as not good. That was called um, nullification by, by jury. You were nullifying the law. And it meant that government could set the law, but the people ultimately had the power to say, no, not good enough. Mm. That person goes free. In a true jury trial, you only need one person you only needed one person to to say, I don't I'm not persuaded of that person's guilt. And the verdict of that jury was then not guilty, even though eleven people had said that that person was. Mm -hmm. You only needed one. Okay. The power in the jury, the jury, as it properly was instituted, is the most powerful manifestation of the power of the people to make sure that we and not our rulers decide on the justice of the of the law itself. And people need to be reminded of some of these fundamentals, that government is here today and gone tomorrow, or should be, but the people are sovereign and are always here, and the power is always ours. And that's what people really need to be reminded of. Pe people fundamentally need to be reminded of the, the, the sacrosanct, the absolute untouchable, the inviolability of the right, the born right of the human being. 
We are not governed by others. We govern ourselves. Our rights are not given to us by the powerful. You're not given your freedom by the police or by the government. You are born free. You are a free individual. And people need to be, if people remember those fundamentals, instead of being cowed in the face of a legislation that says, go to your homes and stay there until we let you out. The next time anyone tries to do that, the people have to be have the confidence to say, no, you can't do that to me. I am free and you do not have the power to take that freedom from me. I've, I've people, heard you. In I, answer to your question, people need to get back to fundamentals. You know it's bad when you get something like your credit card stolen. Uh, you have to go through all of the hassle of getting it replaced, plus working with your credit card company to clear the fraudulent charges. You can't go out and use your credit card until they send you a new one. Imagine how much worse it would be if the thing that was stolen was your actual home. Here's somebody who used to actually do that. Nobody thinks that I can take their house and borrow against the house. Oh, no, I have title insurance for that. No, oh, it's in my name. Or he would have to get some special document. They would call me. You know, what is calling you? After I've stolen the title, borrowed against it, or sold the property, or done whatever I've done with it, it's 60 to 90 days to even figure out that they're the victim of this crime. You know, by that point, you start getting foreclosure notices, and you realize you've got four mortgages on your house. Not only that, you don't even own your home anymore. It's not even in your name. If you want to keep your home's title safe, retain the sanity in the process, the best thing you can do is get yourself ahead of the problem. Title lock, home title lock comes in uh, at this point. You could save so much trouble. Home title fraud is growing like crazy. Here's how to protect yourself and verify your home is still in your name, that title. Visit HomeTitleLock.com. Use the promo code radio, register your address for a no obligation home title report, $100 value free. It's hometitlelock.com. Use the promo code radio. I heard um, uh, an essay that you, uh, you delivered that was, I wonder what would happen if we all just stopped paying taxes. If we all said, <laughs> yes. you know, and you went through a hundred different um, ideas and that's a, it's a great idea, but it only works if we all would do it, right? Yeah. We all have to be on the same page. And when I listen to you, to me, everything rings true. I know history. I've thought this out for 30 years. Um, and I know who the people are. I know where the money comes from. I, I know how the system works that they're playing. Um, but if you, um, if you listen to you and you're not awake yet, you sound incredibly dangerous. <laughs> well, it's, it's only about, I'm not, I'm a, I just can, I'm not the best. I've never been the best at anything. I'm not, I'm just a reasonable guy. I, I'm just, no, I'm, I know, I'm but, interested. But reason, I, I reason and common sense are not part of the ruling class lingo anymore you, you know you, you mentioned that when I, mean, I said what would happen if we if we didn't pay attention. you mentioned fascism actually which is i mean you'll know this but it's always interesting it's always useful to to be reminded that the the word comes from the root is fasci f-a-s-c-i i think mm -hmm. and it, it's it goes all the way back to rome and it, it, it describes it's a bundle of sticks bound together mm -hmm. because a single twig is easily snapped but a bundle of sticks is almost impossible you can't put that over your knee and break it mm -hmm. so that, that is an it's, it's a reminder that people singly are vulnerable but together are indomitable so and th that is, it's important it's important to remember the power of of people backing one another up as you say if they get you on your own you've had it but if people just come together then they are absolutely indomitable. And and when I when I talked about you know not paying taxes or, or I, I suggest you know imagine if we all just stopped paying our mortgages all at once and our rents you stop. They, there's not enough jails in the world to to, right. to put everybody in mortgage jail. So, so actions like that. And I I also say that I think it's time to think the unthinkable when it comes to some elements. I think they've got us into so much debt that the debts need to be written off. Yeah. 
You know, if you go back into history, and, and you'll know this as well, Jubilee, I mean, we just had, yes. before uh, Her Late Majesty right. passed, died, uh, we had her platinum Jubilee. And the Jubilee is an ancient tradition. You know this? Yes. Whereby every every 50 years or so, typically, it was, on the, it was the seventh, seven times seven, 49, seventh yes. Sabbaths after seventh Sabbaths, all debts were cancelled. And all the people who were enslaved on a, in, a, in an ancient kingdom who were enslaved by their debt were set free and allowed to go home. It was like the end of a game of Monopoly because mm-hmm. you know how a game of Monopoly works. Eventually one person's got everything right. and everybody else has got nothing. So that's it. You, there's no more fun to be had. Right. And all the money goes back into the into the bank, to the dealer, and you all start again. Well, Jubilee had that, it was supposed to have that effect. And it was it was canny thinking by the kings because the last thing a king wanted was for any or some of his aristocrats to have amassed so much power in the form of the debt of people beholden to them that they might be able to use those people as an army to overthrow the king. And so it was always in the king's interests every 50 years in a, in a kingdom for the king to say, right, they blew, it was a job blow, the, the horn, a ram's horn was the job, the job blow. They blew the horn, that's it. Everyone go home, all debts are cancelled. That's unthinkable because people will tell you all the reasons why you can't do that. Oh, pe- you know, people's pensions will collapse and, you know, there'll be chaos and carnage and all the rest of it. And, you know, that's probably true. However, some form of that has to be faced up to because we have been indebted deliberately by, you know, fractional reserve banking and all the rest of the insanity that yeah. ensued in the US from the, when the Fed was created in yep. 1913 when everybody was on holiday for Christmas and they slipped through the, the, the ability for these people to, you know, to make money out of nothing and lend Wait, it and lend it and lend it and lend it, hold everybody it, into debt. Hold it just a second. Will you please tell the story, because uh, I had never heard of it. Um, the English, the the Bank of England is printing money, debt, it's all, you know, people are starting to say, I want my silver or gold from the Bank of England. I'm, and, and the British government issued some kind of note. I've never heard this before. Oh, well, oh can you yeah, explain yeah, yeah, that? yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was in the, on the eve of the First World War. So it was in 1914. And everyone knew war was coming, but it hadn't quite happened. War, Britain declared war in August. I think it was May, June. People could you could see the storm clouds building, and as people always do when a war's coming, they want to get tangible wealth. You know, mm-hmm. get get hold of whatever you've got. So in those days, it, it always said on the old fold out. You know, the huge banknotes mm-hmm. that look like a map. They're so big. Mm-hmm. It said on them, "Promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of one pound, ten pound, fifty pounds, whatever." You could literally go to the bank hand over your bit of paper and be given that amount of gold back. That's what we Literally, had with the Federal Reserve. Yes, right. For the Fed. And so so the banks immediately realized we've got a run here. This is going to this is going to run this is going to be a run on the banks. And we'll, everything will go and we won't be able to, and the government won't be able to pay for the war. You won't be able to buy any tanks or guns or uniforms. So they went crying to the government at that point and said you're going to have to so they shut the banks on the Friday night. It was a bank holiday coming, so they shut the banks. And what was it? What was issued? What was very quickly agreed, and and a bill was put through Parliament to 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 make all of this a reality. A bill was put through Parliament to create not notes from not bank uh, not bank notes from the bank, but treasury notes, because obviously the government has a treasury from you know from the days of kings. There's mm-hmm. a treasury. And they were they were issued as treasury notes and they were backed by the government. OK, they're not backed by the bank. They were backed by the government. And they, if you like, they were written against the value of the country. The, the country itself as an as an entity was valued at some mm-hmm. billions of pounds mm-hmm. in 1913. And also, even more importantly, it was the it was the potential of the people. The energy, the creativity, the just the will of the people was also had a value put on it, and that was underwriting these these treasury notes. The signature that was on them was from the was from the the the, the chief secretary to the treasury at that time was a guy called John Bradbury. I think it's John. It's definitely Bradbury, and the people accepted them as Bradbury pounds. And he was really Brad, respected, that was the or. 
he had a lot he, of credibility. Just, or just because his name was his name was just on because it. his okay. name was there. So, pe- mm-hmm. so people were handed these, and they said Bradbury. So they started calling them Bradbury pounds, and they've gone down in history as the Bradbury pound. And so the banks reopened on a on a Monday morning or whatever. I think they stayed closed rather than a one day bank holiday. The bank stayed closed for about three or four days while this was hustled through. The Bradbury pounds were issued, and the people took them. And the people back in 1913 had faith in the country, mm-hmm. were patriotic, and they believed in each other. They believed, yes, as you know, the, the millions of us here and the and the and the natural wealth of the country. This is underscoring this, and so they didn't go to the bank and demand their gold. So it stopped the run on the. There was no run on the pound. There was no run on the currency, and it got it got the banks out of that terrible hole. The, the interesting, tragic, really corollary is within a few months, the banks realised, well, they knew right away, we're not having this because these these Bradbury pounds were debt free, were, were not sorry, were interest free. They weren't being, they, you didn't, if you, if you were, if you took out 10 Bradbury pounds and you had to repay it, you, you only repaid 10. There was mm. no interest on them. Imagine that. Imagine no interest on a loan. You borrow a thousand pounds to buy a car. You pay a thousand pounds back. Okay, there was no interest on them, and the banks took one look at these treasury notes and said, "Enough. We're not going to make any money out of this war." There was a there was a killing to be made in the war, literally and metaphorically, but only if the banks got back to issuing bank notes, and they did. And the bank, the interest rate that the banks established when the when the Bradbury pounds were were withdrawn, bank notes came back in. And the interest on them, the interest on loans or the interest rate that was set at that time was about three and a half percent. And four years later, after the war, everyone had made a lot of money. Mm. Not people like you and me, but the arms manufacturers and the already wealthy that had stakes in all of this. As is the case in every war, every war there's ever been, a handful of people get very, very rich off the back of it. And so the banks stepped in. In, still in 1914 and said, right, enough of the Bradbury pound. That that got people out of that temporary loss of, loss of confidence. Now confidence has been reinstated, restored by the Bradbury pound. Let's get back to business as usual. Three and a half percent, please. Mm. Let's all get rich. Let me um, uh, let me take you back to COVID for a second. What do you uh, what do you make of the. Uh, is there such a thing as excess deaths? Is, is there something. Mm. Are we just, you know, when you buy a car and you're looking at a white car, all of a sudden you start to see that white, you know, Ford everywhere. Um, Are we just noticing or or is there something going on? Because I don't believe anybody. I don't believe anybody anymore. As well as uh, it's never about what they say it's about. I also live by once you see it, you can't unsee it. Correct. So as you say, once you once you notice you remember those 3D pictures that were a craze for a while? That you, At first yeah. glance, they looked like just fuzz. Yeah. But then if you kind of squinted at them, you could make an image step forward mm-hmm. in 3D. Mm-hmm. And once it was there, you couldn't make it go away. You know, it was just, oh, how did I not see the car or the stag or whatever? Mm-hmm. Once you see this nonsense, you get, it's there in three dimensions and you can't not see it. But COVID... Uh, excess deaths. Yes, at the moment, I'm I'm seeing figures at the moment. I'm paying a lot of attention to this at the moment. There's a fantastic guy that I've spoken to throughout this, a guy called Dr. John Campbell. I don't know if you've run across any mm-hmm. of his content yes, on YouTube. Uh, and he, he follows the stats. He's very good. I've, I've spoken to him online and offline and whatever. He's, at the moment, we're, but just before Christmas, the, the excess deaths, which is to say people dying of things other than COVID, we're running at about two and a half thousand a week. At, at the moment, it's about three thousand excess deaths a week in England. The Scottish figures are kept separately by Nicola Sturgeon for her own reasons, and mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not sure of the figures, the latest figures, but it's running at about three thousand a week, I think, in in England, and and. Uh, a, 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 a very worrying, I mean, it's a worrying number anyway, but a proportion of those are people who are dying at home. You know, they're dying those kind of deaths that people aren't aware of until the milk bottles and the mail starts building up outside their front door. And people think, where's where's Janet? Where's mm-hmm. John? And then the police come and they, they break in and they find someone dead in their seat or dead in their bed. 
People who weren't old, weren't ill, they weren't being treated for anything, they didn't have cancer or, or chronic heart disease, they just died. And, and by definition, dying at home means you're not worried about anything. You're not at the doctors, you're not at, at, in the emergency room at mm-hmm. a hospital. You're at home, going about your business, and you stop being alive for no reason that anybody saw coming. These, these kinds of deaths are worrying and inappropriate, and that's why they're called excess. And so there's all sorts of reasons being bandied about. I mean, obviously, two years of lockdown, a lot of us from early on were saying that this will be catastrophic. Locking people in their homes, stopping social contact is going to affect people's immune systems. It's going to stop people getting access to health. They can't get to the doctors. People can, that were a wee can, bit worried about... Mental wee, health. Mental health alone. Mental health. I, I, and so so what we're seeing now, I mean, a tsunami built up, you know, the, the great the water pools out. That's what happened during lockdown. The, the tide disappeared. Mm-hmm. And, now the, and now the wave, the great big wave is coming back in and we're starting to see it in the form of these excess deaths. So so people are dying of, of untreated conditions. As you say, mental health was damaged, all sorts of things. And then, of course, there's all the unasked, the questions you're not supposed to ask. I've said so much more to ask you about, but Neil, I, I think I want to end this conversation um, here. You're an archaeologist. Um, a real highly educated man. You've studied history. As, and I know it would be a pure guess, but where are we on the scale of civilizations? What, if you went out 100 years, what do you see that you think we might find um, a hundred years from now, about this time period and about the next ten or twenty years, where where are we headed? I well, I th- I think this ought to go down as a time of madness. Yes, this is a time in which we have become unmoored from much of the wisdom that we acquired during the last several hundred, if not several thousand years. We have lost the plot, or we haven't, but we are being encouraged to drift into a place of madness. We are told Kenneth we are Clark, told to dismiss everything that became uh, culture building and uh, and common sense over five thousand years. Throw it all out. To to me, it's 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 readily summarised by the fact that here in Britain. Uh, front rank politicians, including the leader of the opposition party, Keir Starmer of the Labour Party, the leader of the Labour Party, a, a prime minister in waiting, if you like, can't or won't define what a woman is. Mm-hmm. When asked the question, what is a woman? He obfuscates and dodges the question. We have a Supreme asked- Court justice that was asked the same question and and. and- and was asked in an open hearing to um, to confirm her uh, spot on the Supreme Court. She couldn't define. She said, "I'm not a scientist." What the? Yeah. So we've, th- that for me is shorthand for the fact that we have become unmoored mm-hmm. from reality, sanity, and reason. Kenneth Clark's a, a historian, an art critic, really, but he he, he made a very a, a landmark television series in the seventies called Civilization. And there's a book that went with it, which I have on my shelf over there. And he he speculated about where civilization comes from and where it goes. And, and he said that, uh, in essence, civilizations don't collapse because of pressure from without, from mm-hmm. outside, barbarians, Correct. whatever. They collapse from within. Mm-hmm. And, it, and why do they collapse from within? You mentioned that idea of, of people that for whom freedom becomes too onerous, mm-hmm. too much of a responsibility. There's another wonderful book by Eric Hoffer, True Believer, where he describes how popular mass movements evolve. And, and there's, there's always, um, there's always an, an extent to which people are uh, persuaded that the past is bad, the present's pretty lousy, and only the future is worth having. And that's always an easy argument to make because the future doesn't exist. And so mm-hmm. nothing's gone wrong with it yet. Mm-hmm. So you sell people in the future and you make them distance themselves from the past. But in civilization, Kenneth Clark said that people become exhausted. 
and they get they they have because it was many generations ago that the civilization was established every succeeding generation takes it for granted a little bit more yes until eventually you get people you get a generation of people who too many of them think that order and the kind of life we have is just in the natural order of things yes when of course you've only got to look out at the wider world to see what the natural order of things actually gives you yep. and it's chaos and it's mob rule and it's violence but too many people get too distanced from the hard work of creating civilization and think that civilization just happens and they become lazy and complacent and they become bored with it hannah arendt when she talked about mm -hmm. the banality of evil she also suggested that people take their present circumstances for granted and they just want something else, anything else. I think that's the period that we're moving through. And of course, you know, at any point from the future, people will look back, and you can always you can always suggest that anapsychosis has a role to play. Now, that, that's a way of looking at, at the the evolution of civilization uh, by Polybius, who was a Greek historian and thinker thousands of years ago. He said that you got a you've got a, you've got a turning wheel, a rotation, a revolution. You start with a good king who, who who appears out of chaos and creates peace, like a kind of King Arthur mm -hmm. who creates a Camelot and everything's great. But then his son didn't have to fight for Camelot. Mm -hmm. So he's not as he doesn't mm -hmm. he doesn't he doesn't care as much. And then his son is even worse, and around him grows uh, powerful men, aristocrats. They eventually overthrow a weak prince, and you've got aristocracy rather than monarchy. The first band of aristocrats are all right as well. They've, they've, got, they've got ideas. That degenerates as well. They pass the power to their sons and daughters, and eventually it degenerates into uh, oligarchy, which is the rule of rich men who are only in power because they're wealthy. And that's where we are. Eventually the, people, eventually the people get tired of the oligarchs, and they overthrow them. And that means you've got democracy, You've got people power. And the first democracy is good because people had to fight for it and struggle and achieve it and overthrow the oligarchs. But again, a few generations down, it degenerates and you've got people taking democracy for granted, which is where we are now. And that degenerates into mob rule. And we all know about mob rule. We see it in third world countries and all the rest of it. It's chaos. Out of the, out of the mob rule rises a demagogue, a charismatic figure who says, follow me and I'll take you to the, the sunlit Promised uplands land. again. And the, and the demagogue is false. He's a straw man. He's hollow. The demagogue is eventually overthrown by the good king. And where are we now? We're, then you're back, at the, you're back at midnight right. again. You're back at the top of the clock. And then the whole process starts again. In answer to your question, I think we're at that point now where, the, where people are taking it all for granted. It's the democracy that people have become bored with. They think that you just have peace on the streets, law and order, uh, equality before the law, uh, you know, safety to walk the streets at night, uh, all of this magic. You turn up at a bus stop and a bus comes. You, you go to an ATM and you put your card in and money comes out. Right. People think that these things just happen. Mm -hmm. But we've now entered into the period where too many, too, too large a proportion of the population are taking all of that for granted. And they think anything would be better than this. And the problem we've got is that there are people out there like the WEF, like the WHO, the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. like all these transnational corporations like BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street, who are more than happy to step in and offer people that something else. Oh, but yeah. what the people don't appreciate is that that something else is going to end up being something they really don't like. Yeah. And tragically, I think for too many of them, it will only be when they've got it, when they're in that digital cage made of central bank digital currencies and digital IDs and social credit systems a la the Chinese Communist Party, that model, only when that gate, that cage door slams shut, click, will people see, how did this happen? Well, this is how it happens. All right, well, I don't want to leave us on that. <laughs> Let me ask one more thing. I don't want to leave that because I'm a miserable like, bastard. Glenn. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm not invited to a lot of parties because that's usually the way where I am too. Um, I can be. I can. I can lift it. I can lift it. But you know, I am optimistic. I am. I make myself be optimistic. I am. I'm. I'm married. 
been married a long time. My wife is a much more positive force than I am. Mm -hmm. So we are in that we are that yin and yang thing. Yeah, yeah. You know that's me and my wife same. Light and dark. Mm -hmm. She 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 takes me by the throat and lifts me up. Right. And so, and so I, I take, but she makes, I become, I, I obtain optimism from her by osmosis. <laughs> if I stand close enough to my wife, it seeps into me. It is so, I I'm telling you, we are brothers. I said to my wife at one point, I'm stealing light from you. I'm just, cause I felt like a black hole and it's like, I should tell you, yeah. I'm just sucking all the goodness and light out of you. I do it all the time. Some people radiate energy and the rest yeah. of us are sponges for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but, but but so when I'm in my when I'm fully charged when I've stood close enough to her battery to get back up to 65 70 percent, I remind myself that plenty of people have learned this as well. Mm -hmm. it, so you know that bit in Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. uh, in uh, when 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 Frodo and is talking to Gandalf, they're in the mines, Moria. Mm -hmm. It's all dark. It's just at the start of the Fellowship of the Ring, and in the darkness, Frodo says to Gandalf, "I wish this hadn't happened to me." I love this. I wish I didn't have to do it. And Gandalf says, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. nobody that finds themselves in a situation like this wants it to happen to them. Right. We don't get to choose the time that we are in. We only get to decide what to do with the time that we have. And that is fundamentally true. At any minute, you can make the worst of things or the best of things. Both of those things, it's like Schrodinger's cat. Mm -hmm. you, you can have Both. success and failure are in the box all at the same time. And you don't know what you're going to get till you open the box. And plenty of people over the last couple of years have actually benefited from this experience because it's been dark, oh, yeah. but it's also been a slap in the face. Yeah. You there sleeping. Wake up. Yeah. And a lot of people have, what, that, well, that was sore. What? And people are awake. And it's not everybody. It's possibly not even the majority, but you don't need the majority. You just need a very active, awake, a pay, a aware, reasoned, thinking group of people acting in concert, acting together. And we can turn this ship around. That's the way to end it. Thank you very much, Neil. Really appreciate it. Uh, I well, hope I've to been, talk to you again. I've, I see, I've done all the talking. Talking. I feel, well, you feel are I the guest. Rambling on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Big string. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, it's funny. Um, Neil, um, I wanted to talk to you, and we just didn't get around to it, about Jeremy Clarkson. Is he going to survive yeah. this? Oh, I tell you what, Glenn. I, I've been reading Jeremy Clarkson uh, uh, columns and books for years. And I've watched, love I've loved, him. Love know, him. Top Gear. Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the Grand Tour. Yeah. His latest thing, The Farm. Yeah. You know, where he's, he's, he's exposed the reality right. of what it is to farm with all yeah. the regulations and all the rest of it. He's brilliant. Brilliant. And uh, why people decide, well, why anyone just took, was suddenly surprised that he, he's taken a pop. He, he said something about, about, about Meghan yeah. Markle. Okay. And, but he's been saying some pretty offensive stuff about all sorts of his things, whole as long as I can life. Remember. His whole life. That's his shtick. <laughs> right. That's his shtick. You know, right. he, he zones in on somebody and he rips them a new one. That is, that is what he does. And he makes people look silly. That's what he does. And, you know, it's always somebody's turn to, to get it from Jeremy. But he's a, a supremely clever writer and a supremely clever broadcaster. Oh, right? yeah. You don't get many people with, with that set, that oh, skill set. Oh, I agree. And you certainly don't throw them away when you find one. Um, but what he what he demonstrates in living colour, this division, is you cannot appease the mob. Yep. When, I've had it. You've, I'm sure you've had it. <laughs> you know, I've... I did, I did things, years, whatever, and people said to me, you're going to have to take down that tweet or you're going to have to apologise for that. And I've never done either. Jeremy's mistake was he apologised. Mm -hmm. And these people don't want an apology. No, they want a skin. They want you to expose, they want you to expose your throat so that they can rip it out. Yep. And the moment Jeremy Clarkson started to say, I shouldn't have said that and I wish I hadn't, that was it. His throat was exposed, and they went for him. And if if they can, if that happens to someone as big, metaphorically and literally, he's about six and a half feet tall. <laughs> yeah. And and he he bestrides the world of broadcasting like a silverback in the yeah. in the jungle. Yeah. If that can happen to him, 
will watch because that means that can happen to anybody. M- Meghan Markle did it to Piers Morgan as well. He was another big beast in the in the broadcast jungle. She she you know she brought him down too. And so the the lesson there, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, is don't try to appease the mob. You stand firm and you say, I said what I said, take it or leave it. Yeah. You know, and here in America, nobody's going to affect my life by saying, I think I think she's the worst thing. And I don't really like the royal family at all. But she, I think, is one of the worst things to happen to the royal family since, well, King Charles. So <laughs> it's, well, it's certainly it's certainly looking that way, Glenn. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not I'm pretty ambivalent. The, the royal family for me are just there a bit like the Cairngorm mountain range yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or yeah. red pillar boxes or or. Yeah. Or whatever, or or Buckingham Palace, they're just there. Yeah, I I don't, and I, in the same way that I don't like statues getting torn down, I just say they're all they're just there, just let them yeah. get on with it. <laughs> you know, they're they're fun to watch. They're like the Simpsons, but not yellow. They're just just watch them they, because you know they, they do stuff just as bonkers as Bart and Homer. Just, just watch. <laughs> 